Thank you, Alexander. So I'm going to tell you about the adaptively secure global circuits from one-way function. So what is the problem? I want a server to compute a circuit on an input without learning anything else about the circuit or the input. Uh, I'm assuming that the topology of the circuit is known, so that's not something I need to hide. So we have two parties. We can think of the second party as a server, and the uh, first party has all of the information, the circuit and the input, so it will garble the circuit, send it over, at some point gets the input or decides on an input, also garbles it and sends it to the second party, and somehow the second party is able to evaluate the circuit and get the output. Of course, I want correctness, security, and efficiency, and I might even want some other properties from the garbling scheme, but we just talk about this three. So, what do I want from, uh, what do I mean when I say efficient? I think about the computation in two phases, the offline phase where we are garbling the circuit, and you can think that you're not in a rush at this point, and then there is the online phase where you have the input and you want to be able to garble the input quickly. In particular, you don't want to spend as much time as it takes to do the computation yourself. So when we say an efficient online complexity, we are talking about uh, something that is much smaller than the size of the circuit. So, when it comes to security, we have two definitions. The selective version, where we have our adversary and the challenger, and the adversary picks an input, and it gets back to the garbled circuit and the garbled input. I say that the system is secure if there is a simulator that gets only the output of the computation and uh, can simulate the garbled circuit and garbled input. And we want these two distributions to be indistinguishable for any circuit. When it comes to adaptive security, we just change the game a little bit. So we still want the same thing, except that now the adversary gets to choose the input after seeing the garbled circuit. And similarly, the simulation needs to output the simulated garbled circuit before seeing anything and then gets the output of the computation. So what do we know about the online complexity of an adaptively secure garbling scheme? We know that it has to at least be the size of the input plus the size of the output. And uh, so the two other parameters that is, we can consider is the width of the circuit, which is proportional to the base complexity of the computation and the depth of the circuit. So we don't assume anything about the circuit. It can be a very long circuit, but it's very, uh, with very small width, or it can be a very a wide circuit, but very, very small depth. The only thing that we know is that the width has to be at least the size of the input or the output. So, what are the constructions that we have already? The, the work of the Blair et al. shows that, well, we can actually have adaptively secure global circuits from one-way function. The online complexity is the size of a circuit, but we have other, uh, it has other nice properties in addition to the efficiency, uh, in addition to the security. Uh, that makes it very desirable for some like, parallel computation and other things. Um, the, oops, <laughs> there is the work of uh, Bonne Tal that assumes exponential LWE and gets the online complexity proportional to the input and the output and the depth of the circuit. There are two constructions that actually get the optimal, um, that get the optimal online complexity but assume very strong assumptions like I, IO and universal computational extractors. What do we get in this work? We create a construction that is only based on one-way functions and give us online complexity proportional to the depth or to the width of the circuit. So this is just one result, but yeah, it has two instantiations of it, so you can just picture where that suits your circuit best. Um, I just want to point out for the rest of the talk, our circuits are going to be toppled over on the side, so the input is on the left, output on the side, and uh, the depth is actually the horizontal line. So next we're going to see the Yao's gar garbling scheme and see the proof of security for it, and then we will have enough intuition to see why it's difficult to have adaptively secure garbling schemes. So starting with just one gate, you can, we have two inputs wires, one output wire, we give each of them, uh, uh, we give each of them two random keys associated with val wire values 0 and 1, and to garble it, we look at the 
um, thread table of the gate, and for each line I would create one ciphertext, which is an encryption of the output wire using the input wire keys. I'll use this uh, notation of the encryption with two keys just to show this double encryption of the output key. So if you want to, so we do the same thing for all of them and we just randomize the, these ciphertexts. So to, comp to evaluate this gate, you just need to have, sorry, you need to have one of the keys. Why isn't this working? Okay. So you need to know about one of the keys of each of the wires and then you can get, you can decipher exactly one of these ciphertexts and get back the output key. And for security, we have to make sure that is, you only get one of those keys out, not anything else. So for garbling the entire circuit, you just repeat the same thing for all of the gates. And you have the garbled circuit. You also have to map the output wires into values zero and one. And this would be our, what we do during the offline phase. And therefore, garbling of the input, you just give back the keys that are associated with the input X. What does the simulator do? That try to do the same thing as much as possible. She chooses the keys, but doesn't know what the gate is doing. So it will just um, encrypt all zeros, that just one key is going to be in the simulated gate, and repeats the same thing for all of them. And since it knows the output, it can just map the output wires that are associated with zero to the values of y, and this would be the garbled circuit um, for the simulation. And then to garble the input, we'll just give all the zeros. So now we have to just show that these two distributions are indistinguishable. Um, we start with hybrid arguments, meaning that I'm going to define some distributions that are a hybrid of both uh, the simulation and the real. Um, garbling and changing the gates one by one from the real to the simulated um, and keep doing that until all of the circuit is read. So this would be fine if these two were actually distinct indistinguishable but they in fact are totally distinguishable because one of them is always outputting um, zero and the other one outputs something that is dependent on what the input was so they don't even compute the same thing sometimes, but they want to be distinguishable. So we look at our simulated gate, and we see that the problem is that we are always encrypting C0, but we get the answer right there because we know the input X, we are getting it right here. So I can just define a new version of the simulated gate that depends on the input aptly named input dependent simulated gate, and I just put the right uh, key here that depends on the input x, that I know the right output here, and now if I replace this one, I can actually say that these two are computationally distinguishable. So it's great, we're gonna just replace this, um, replace the red ones with the, instead use the black ones, and keep doing that over and over. Um, I just want to make uh, note that there is a, it's important that we are going about changing the colors row by row because, for example, if I want to turn this one black, uh, I'm going to be in trouble because there is a wire that comes from a real gate, and then I can't really say anything about the distinguishability of these two um, distributions. So it's important that the first the input, uh, the gates that the input wires are coming from are already simulated before I turn the output one into a black gate. So this would be fine. So we keep doing this until the whole thing is black, and then we just notice that these two are the same distribution. So, so um, we, we had three rules when we were changing the distributions. And we started with the input gains, and we were able to turn those into black gates. And um, so if it gets all of its inputs was coming from black gates, then we could turn it into a black. And finally, when the entire circuit was black, we were able to say that this is the same as being all red. We actually can change that last rule and refine it a bit because we can turn these 
turn black gates into red gates way before. Um, like I can turn this gate into a red gate because its output is only going to a simulated gate. So when you look at the garbling of the scheme, they both have only one key, and that key also is going into another simulated gate. So these two are exactly the same distribution. Everything else is symmetric, so it's just a matter of whether you interpret this as a zero or not. Doesn't change anything else. So I, I can actually use this um, new rule that says that the black gate with all of its inputs going into simulated gate can be turned red. Um, it doesn't make any difference as far as for selective security goes. We already have a sec selective security proof, but it will be useful for that adaptive case. So why is it difficult to show that IAO is adaptively secure? Uh, to start with, we don't, um, the online complexity of the IAO scheme is too small. It's only the size of the input. The size of the input, but this is very easy to solve. We just send the output table in the online phase. And this not only gives us the right online complexity, uh, it also solves the problem of simulation because the garbling of the circuit didn't really use the output. It was only the output table that was using the output. So now we have, not only we have a correct and efficient scheme, we also have a simulator. We have just had to have an indistinguishability proof. And you can imagine this is where things go wrong because our first hybrid had an input-dependent simulated gate. So this wire depended on the input that I'm only getting after uh, I've already given out the garbled circuit. So this really isn't even well-defined. And this would be the main problem that we have. So this approach doesn't work and doesn't mean that Yao is not adaptively secure, but it does mean that that approach is not going to help us. So what do we do? We start with adaptive, we start with this modified version of Yao again, um, and we try to solve this problem of not being able to have black gates. So we have to come up with a way to go around this problem of not being able to have hybrids that have black gates. To do this, we define a new encryption scheme and we construct that. That what they, this new magical encryption scheme does is just that it lets me exactly define such hybrids where there are gates that I can decide about them in the online phase. And uh, another great thing about it is that the, its key only grows with the number of black gates. So if its key would be way, well, it's if the key is too big, then it wouldn't be really useful. Why? Because what I'm going to do is to, go, to encrypt the entire Yao's garbled circuit with this encryption and give, give the key of the encryption in the online phase so I care that this key is not too big. So what the evaluator would do is just to decrypt it and do the uh, evaluation as it did before. So that would be the first thing that we need to do. And the second thing is to keep, make sure that the number of black gates are small uh, because the key is growing with the number of black gates and then the key is part of the online complexity and I want to keep that small. So to do that, we try to find a way to turn the black gates into the simulated gates as soon as possible because the simulated gates don't depend on the input and I can do that. I can create them in the off offline phase and we do this using some smarter ways of doing hybrid arguments. So what is this magical encryption? It's called somewhere equivocal encryption, and I'm just going to show you what it does. Imagine you have a message that um, is a vector of messages, and we're going to have two procedures, the honest procedure and the simulated procedure. The honest procedure um, does what you expect an honest procedure to do. It creates this, there's a key generation that gives you a key, and then there's an encryption that this key gets the key and the message and produces a cipher text. Oh, then there's a decryption key, the decryption function. So, but does the simulation procedure do? It just gets part of the message, and there are like some holes in this vector, but it still produces a cipher text that is looking very similar to the uh, cipher text of the honest procedure. And then there's another procedure that gets the rest of the messages and creates a key that will decrypt this cipher text into the correct messages that we wanted. So to see this pictorially, 
the honest procedure will have the message and the key, and then comes up with a way to cover the message completely. <coughs> but, what does the, but what the simulated procedure will do is only get some of the messages and no key, and will still create a ciphertext. And then when it gets the rest of the messages, it comes up with a key that the key will make sure that when you decrypt this ciphertext, you will get all the messages. The great thing about this, this encryption scheme is that the security definition guarantees that these two will actually look indistinguishable from each other. And we get this, we construct this based on distributed point functions that themselves are based on one-way functions. And the last great thing about this scheme is that the key grows only with the number of holes. So now that we have this encryption scheme, as we saw before, we're just going to encrypt the uh, garbling of Yao's garbled circuit and give the key in the online phase. What does the simulator do? Does the exact same thing, just using the garb simulated garbled circuit. So both of them are using the honest procedure. Neither of them are doing anything with, this, with the simulated procedure. So this is just the honest procedure for both of them. Where we use this simulated procedure for the encryption is going to be doing the, the indistinguishability proof. So let's see our first hybrid. So in our, my first hybrid, I'm going to first put a hole instead of the first where the first gate was. And then in the online phase, when I know the input x, I will come up with a key that will put the input dependent gate, simulated gate in there. So voila, this is where the magic happens. And now we did it. We wanted to come up with a way to uh, define hybrids with black gates, and we succeeded. So this was the, one of the main points that we wanted to achieve, and we did. I just want to point out there is actually an intermediate step here. If it ever, that where we have a hole, but we are still, we put the key that will put the right, like the real gate here, not the input dependent simulated gate. And here I can, Argue that based on the equivocal encryption scheme security, these two are indistinguishable, and based on CPA security, these two are indistinguishable. But this is just an intermediate hybrid, and I will go through it every time I want to take one of those steps, and I won't mention it anymore. So that's it. Now we are able to do this. We can go back to our rules that we had before for selective security and just take the same exact steps. We only have one additional rule that says that every black gate needs to have a hole. So our rules of the distinguishable says, says that every black gate has to have a hole. So the number of black gates determine, determines the number of the holes. Then we start with the input gates. We can turn those into black gates. And same, the same rules that we had um, before. So using these rules, now we can um, have a hybrid distribution for adaptive case. Uh, we first we start with the input gates. By rule one, I will, I will be able to turn those black. By rule two, I can turn the next um, row black because the previous one already are black. By rule three, I can turn this first row into red gates. These are now simulated gate and are not dependent on the input. And I can just keep doing that until the entire circuit is red. I just want to point out that we never used more than two rows of black gates. So my, uh, this, therefore, the key of the somewhere equivocal encryption only has to be proportional to the width of the circuit. Then we generalize this method by noticing that our rules are very similar to pebbling rules. So we define a new pebbling game where these are the, the rules. And if at any time that I uh, go from blue to black, you can think of it as placing a black pebble on a node. And then every time I go from black to red, you can think of it as removing that black gate, that, that pebble, black pebble. So now I can just translate this into a bubbling game on a, surf, on a graph where 
So that says that the pebble can be placed on an input node. A pebble can be placed if its predecessors already have pebbled, and it can be removed if its successors have pebbles. Um, this is a little bit too simplified because our rules are actually going both ways here. So I can actually remove a pebble and go back to blue and also here, but since we, our destination is red, there is no real intuition why we would want to go back from red. So, but this might be still useful. Um, so that now, now that we have this rule, uh, we have this game, pebbling game, we start with a graph that is all blue and you want to end up with a graph that is all red and you have to follow these rules to get from here to here. And the great thing is that we have a way now to just try to come up with a pebbling strategy instead of trying to find sequences of hybrids. So our theorem says that there, if there is a way to pebble the circuit with S steps and P pebbles, then, um, and if the encryption scheme for the gates is epsilon CPA secure and the big encryption of the whole entire circuit is uh, somewhere equivocal encryption that it's epsilon secure with uh, equivocation parameter P, this is the number of holes that we can tolerate. Um, then we can say that our new garbling scheme is S time epsilon adaptively secure with online complexity, that is the size of the input and output, plus the number of pebbles that we have. So we already saw one pebbling strategy, which was going row by row. We can think of this step as removing those black pebbles and then put, using them to put pebbles on the next level and then again removing pebbles, putting more pebbles today. So this is actually a pebbling strategy with number of pebbles in order of the width of the circuit and the number of the step is just the size of the circuit. So using this, we have our main, we can plug this into the previous theorem. And so there's a strategy with these parameters and this gives us that our scheme is secure with online complexity proportional to the width. There is another strategy that has, that has number of pebbles proportional to the depth of the circuit and the number of steps being um, exponential in the depth. So our scheme is secure with online complexity order of depth, but uh, the security will de degrade exponentially in depth. Mm -hmm. So you might want to just use it for very low depth circuits. There can be other pebbling strategies that are more efficient for a specific class of uh, circuits. So if you have a class of circuits that has a very good pebbling strategy, then you can use our scheme and you get, get much better security parameters for it. Um, that's it, thank you. <laughs>